Your parents were one of the, the, the you know, among the quote pioneers post prohibition. Uh, prohibition, and you know, it's like you kind of grew up uh, in that kind of era, you know, with your parents being here. Uh, you're pretty young. Um, you know, what was that like? Well, it was, I mean, it was a. Uh, I think it was a great way to grow up. Uh, I think my parents were very uh, excited about this whole new kind of agricultural enterprise that uh, that they were embarking on, and so they uh, were excited enough that I think they really involved the whole family and involved the kids a lot in in what they were doing. Um, and. Uh, how many brothers sisters do you have? I have two brothers that are older uh-huh. than me. I have an older sister and then a younger sister. Uh-huh. So there's five of us. Yeah. And uh, we moved out to this property when I was three. When you were three. Yeah. And so you lived um, on the property here. Right. Itself? So uh-huh. lived. Um, we first for the first year we lived in a trailer uh, uh, down um, by the old barn down there, and then uh, my parents built a house that we lived in. Uh, uh-huh. And I lived on site here till I was 18. Uh-huh. And so, um, I assume that you know you had chores to do then, you know, like pruning and. Yeah. So, all my brothers and sisters uh, worked in in the vineyard. I think uh, back then, um, when we when my folks first planted the first 10 acres, which was half Pinot Noir and half Chardonnay, um, they really relied on. Uh, friends and family, uh-huh. and uh, I was a bit young at that stage, but gr- growing up, um, you know, every, uh, certainly all through the summer, working in the vineyards, doing, uh, you know, shoot thinning and leaf pulling and working with the wires, and, and then later doing work in the winery, bottling, things like that. It was, uh-huh. uh, even as a young kid, I was roped into helping with all that. And how was that? I mean, it's like a lot of kids like resent, you know, um, you know that that kind of work, and other kids are just excited. Yeah, I think we all kind of um, had a bit of a uh, bit of resentment to, uh, you know, um, certainly having to work what we perceived as working harder than our peers, uh, and uh, um, you know, uh, in hindsight, I think we got a lot out of it. And uh, and we're you know I think we're all better for it, but uh, and certainly I'm more connected to the land because of having done that. But uh, I think at the time my brothers and sisters and and I were all kind of a bit a bit resentful about having to work every summer that hard. Yeah, you said you got <laughs> more out. What, what did you get out of it? Um, well, you know when I look around at my peers. Uh, you know, in in the wine industry here and in California, so many people um, they're they're new to it, and ah. and they have um, you know, I guess just a more limited scope in terms of the their knowledge about um, vintages and and uh, how the weather's influence on things. And uh, I always like the fact that even though you know my job now is winemaking and and managing. Um, all of our uh, employees here, there's uh, no job at the winery that I haven't done because I started as a kid where, you know, you were from the ground up. So even all the vineyard uh, tasks and working in a vineyard, uh, pruning and all that uh, is, uh, is something that I'd done at one stage or another. Yeah. So that gives us, you know, some validity and also some firsthand knowledge of what it's like to be out there. And probably some perspective too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. It's like you spent quite a bit of time, like in the vineyard, um, and uh, you know, what what kind of things did the vineyard kind of teach you? you know, say, like about life. Well, I think that um, I definitely think of um, life as having you know a um, seasonal element to it. And, uh, you know, um, that's one thing, you know, we definitely see in, you know, if you follow the growth cycle of the vine, uh, that it really kind of informs your life and you you kind of get on that same cycle. And I don't know, I guess I don't really know, but I 
I would assume for other people that aren't connected to a um, annual agricultural product that they might not have the same view of, of life uh -huh. uh, being uh, so uh, dictated by Mother Nature and, and by the seasonal changes that we experience in one year. Yeah. And so you can't take vacations during the summer, you have to take them in November? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we don't even think about going away during the growing season. And not just because it, it would be difficult to get away, but just because, uh, you know, that's what you're kind of, you're working the whole year to, to that. And that's, you know, in some ways the crescendo of uh, the, the growing season there in the late summer. Yeah. Yeah, and then through, then through harvest. Now, um, thinking back like when you were a kid, and uh, you know your parents are probably dragging you around, you know, to like the different meetings of other uh, wine growers or grape growers and stuff like that. It's like, what kind of memories do you have of that? You know. Well, I think you know, um, I think you know, really positive memories of um, you know other people in uh, in the wine business and. Uh, that, again, it was a group of people that were all very excited and motivated to be doing something different than everyone else. Um, you remember any particular kind of, you know, like, I mean, there were some pretty contentious kind of personalities. There were some really strong personalities uh, involved there. And so, like, all these people trying to come together to, to share and, and, and things. And it seems like there could be some interesting sparks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gosh, I don't remember too many uh, of that type of thing, but uh, I remember, you know, growing up in uh, the time we did here in the Oregon wine industry, um, you were, in some ways, you felt like it, it, your uh, family was doing something interesting and special, but the other side of that coin was it was doing something very weird and odd, mm. uh, and, uh, you know, I... I grew up going to a local school, and and agriculture is a agriculture is a big part of that school, and and uh, I think today uh, grape growing is a part of that agricultural scene. Yeah. But when I was there, it was just something totally weird, and and uh, not um, not necessarily I think uh, respected or revered like it is today, but just like oh that's pretty crazy. Why are they doing that here? Uh -huh. And uh, um, so I think you know. Um, being uh, at those wine meetings and at, at functions with uh, other people uh, doing the same thing, uh, all working towards that same goal and being interested in, in wine and, and uh, good food and, uh, um, you know, uh, travel and things like that. It, it was nice because it was different than, than maybe my peers at a uh, you know, local schools here in Yamhill. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I think, well, when I started school there, there wasn't anybody else in the school that its parents were doing anything involved with wine. Yeah, that would be. Did they razz you or, you know, give you a... a no, I just think that they were just, they kind of didn't, didn't comprehend that there was any um, value in, in uh, growing grapes. They just couldn't conceive of it. Yeah. So, uh, um, I think they just thought it was funny, you know, and, uh -huh. and a bit weird, and, and yeah. uh, um, it's a real contrast to today, where I think, uh, you know, um, my kids um, don't go to schools in Yamhill, but I, I have friends that do, and, you know, in a class of 20 kids, there might be five, six kids that parents are somehow involved in, in this industry out here. Oh, that's interesting, isn't yeah. it? Huh. Yeah. Um, Shoot, I lost the question. <laughs> so I gotta, I, I've got to keep those questions in mind and quit listening so intently. <laughs> um, I've got to go back to my, my questions here. So, you, you know, it's like you had a lot of brothers and sisters, and I'm assuming that none of them are involved in the, in the wine industry. Right, so they've all done other things and, and have, um, you know, have great other... Uh, careers. My young, youngest sister is still young enough that she's trying to find out what she wants to be doing, but I don't think it'll be involved in the wine industry. And uh, basically, my parents, um, they didn't push us to be involved in the business at all. I think partly because um, 
they didn't know where it was going to be taking, you know, where they would take this business and also just not wanting to um, have anybody involved here as a reluctant participant. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a great way, you know, to raise kids and because, you know, basically they, um, not in so many words, but said, hey, if you're interested in wine and if you love wine and if you love, um, you know, the lifestyle and the community and this agricultural product, then, uh, you know, there's a place for you here. But if you don't, go find what you do love. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so my dad, my brother's a doctor and my other brother's an engineer and my sister's a nurse and a, and a home maker mm -hmm. um, mother. And uh, again, my other sister has done some interesting things and, and will find a career, I'm sure. Probably outside of wine because none of them are really truly, um, I think they like wine, but they're not passionate about wine. Yeah. And uh, if you're not passionate about it, um, I don't think that you'd put up with the, the uh, hard work of it all. <laughs> yeah. So what, what pulled you into... Uh well, I, I think what started was, um, you know, uh, throughout, um, after high school, I came back and did a couple harvests where mm -hmm. I'd work uh, full time at harvest. Uh, and, and what was that? I mean, that, that you volunteer, volunteered to come back or they, they asked, your parents yeah, asked you to I come think, help? Well, I think that, you know, I was, um, you know, not ready to go to college full time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, for me, it was kind of a job and a way to make money to go travel. So I um, did harvest in 89 and 90, um, made um, money to go travel to Europe and um, kind of trying to figure what I wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, throughout my four years of college, I would come and work uh, certainly in the summers and, and uh, um, do, you know, wine deliveries in Portland and kind of saw different aspects of it. And after... Um, college, I really didn't have any other um, thoughts except to come and you know work primarily in the vineyard. That's what where I saw kind of my niche. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Hi. 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 I think we've met before. We have. Uh, we've met in the vineyard. Yes. Yeah. Glad <laughs> yeah. to meet you again. Yes. And I understand that uh, you had a great time in Argentina. This little thing here. And so. Pat, if, um, this is for the transcriber. If you could tell me your name. Pat Campbell. Okay. It's the, 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 the transcriber knows, you know, and I write notes, but I just want to make sure that they get the right name, sure. or the right, uh, uh, because these things become like 30 pages uh, of, of material. Um, uh, Pat, can we let um, Adam just kind of finish his thought? He, we were just talking about, um, you know, how, what, what, what Siren called him to, uh, you know, and he, and I have to compliment you because he said that you you know like you and, and Joe never forced him. You know, he could do choose whatever he wanted to do. So compliments to you on that. Yeah. So I think when I first decided I you know wanted to to make this my life, uh, it was mostly uh, in the vineyard and uh, kind of getting back to that and um, doing. Uh, Vineyard management here. I think there was a good niche for me uh, with uh, my mom kind of running the business side of it and uh, had done a lot of the vineyard stuff, but my dad's still very involved in doing the winemaking. That was a way I could kind of come in and, and uh, have an impact and uh, differentiate, you know, myself and what I had to offer was in the vineyard and uh, very motivated to, to uh, find new properties and get new vineyard sources not only for uh, purchasing grapes but um, buying properties so uh, we bought our Mount Richmond property I think a year after I came on full-time mm -hmm. and uh, um, started planting it the next year so was there a defining moment or you know or was it a kind of a gradual thing or you know did um... yeah I think probably a, a gradual thing I think you know there's always um, you know, uh, indecision about how um, comfortable uh, my folks were at having me come in and and uh, to be in charge of, at the beginning, one aspect of our business, but eventually being, you know, in charge of all aspects, that uh, it kind of has to be a, a progression because they need to feel comfortable that 
I have the um, skills to to take their uh, baby and you know and uh, be able to uh, have it as my own and to to nurture it and to make it successful yeah I think that takes that definitely takes a little while so starting in the vineyard and proving myself there I think was a was a good thing and then uh, I always say that you know if you're passionate about wine and you're doing one aspect of it such as growing the grapes there's no way you're not going to want to take it to the fullest expression which is to um, then take those grapes that you grow and and to make wine out of it so I think that's when I started uh, edging more into the winemaking side yeah yeah and and um, do you remember like any particular moment uh, to go from the vineyard because like a lot of people stay in the vineyard and um yeah, I think it was mostly that, it, you know, even though I was very passionate about um, growing high quality grapes, that uh, ultimately you want to, if, you, if you're into wine and, and you, you're uh, growing these high quality grapes, you want to have the say on what it takes to make those into the best quality wine. Uh -huh. And so, uh, you know, working in, in kind of conjunction with my dad was great because I learned a lot uh, about... Um, wine making and and uh, both he and my mom's philosophy on, on making wine uh, but ultimately if, if you're uh, confident in who you are and if you're really into wine you want to uh, do it yourself and make make uh, make all the decisions about yeah it, about it so Pat how was that transition for you uh, you know first of all it's like your son wants to be mm -hmm. you know part of the mm -hmm. thing and then you know like he wants to you know become winemaker well, I think that when Adam uh, came to us and told us that he knew what he wanted to do with his life and that he wanted to make wine, it was one of the happiest days for me uh, because, uh, you know, you can, we'd been working very, very hard at uh, um, wine making and, and grape growing for about 21 years and, uh, and just kind of run out of steam. Oh. Uh, and so to have a uh, new life come in um, it just it was just a wonderful thing to have happen and something that neither Joe or I were expecting uh, because we just knew well Adams at Lewis and Clark he's in political science he's probably going to become a lawyer <laughs> and uh, so uh, when Adam started uh, working with us um, I think that was a good time as well because we were able to start making some improvements in the vineyard um, not only by buying new property but uh, also by uh, improving the way we were growing grapes. Uh, what uh, was that in specific? Uh, well, by uh, severely limiting the crop on the Pinot Noir and uh, which involved uh, more work in the vineyard more by thinning, thinning, yeah. and uh, we'd always rub buds too. But I think that we we took it much more seriously, the trellising uh, early and uh, leaf pulling, and uh, and then the crop thinning, which are all things that uh, we discovered were very very important for making better Pinot Noir, which was very important to start doing that because the competition in the wine business was getting fairly fierce and, and you you really had to also start making better wine so you could raise your prices uh, some. Um, and I guess our prices were pretty low back uh -huh. in those days. Um, so anyway, Adam was very involved with uh, keeping us on track with that. I mean, I think for somebody who hasn't really done severe thinning it's really hard to go out there and cut all those grapes off um, but uh, so you were used to like um, you're in your spacing is like what kind of tonnage per acre were you used to and then what did you go to um, we were probably oh, averaging about four tons per acre uh -huh. and then uh, so then we went down to well the first time we did we put about three tons per acre and then we realized we needed to go uh, more and so we got down about uh, two and a half especially for the uh, reserve wines and, and even to two tons per acre on some of the the single vineyard wines. Yeah that's a lot of fruit on the ground. It is, it is. It's about half, uh, usually at least half. Um, so that's 
what we have to do to make better wine. And so what, um, Adam, like, you know, where did, where did your ideas, you know, come from? Well, I think, um, you know, getting really involved in the, in the grape growing and, um, you know, trying to, you know, come up with ways to increase the quality. Um, basically just listening to my peers and talking with them and, and finding out what other people are doing and then, uh, you know, incorporating some of the ideas that I thought might work, doing some trials, um, and, uh, you know, really dialing our vineyards into to where they would show best. And, and uh, um, yeah, so it's kind of a slow process, but, uh, you know, overall, I think with, with, not only with thinning, but just with, in general, higher quality viticulture, we've seen good results in the wine and then been rewarded in the marketplace for that. And uh, ultimately, I always kind of describe it as finding where um, you shine in in relation you know, to everything, everyone else. So for us, um, we need to grow the qual kind of quality grapes that make a wine that, uh, that uh, uh, can compete on the world stage uh, in that uh, $20 to $30 price point. And, uh, um, to do that, you need to to do the things in the vineyard to to grow grapes that that have the wine measure up. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, that whole flood of questions here. One is, Adam, what did you sell your first bottle of wine for? How much did you sell it for? Well, we had various price points, but I think that you know the Willamette Cuvée was probably selling for twelve to fifteen dollars a bottle. 15. And Pat. Your very first bottle of wine, do you remember how much you sold it for and what it was in a uh, year? Well, I think that uh, I remember Riesling for six seventy five. Six seventy five. Yeah. What year was that? That would have been 1979, and that was from the uh, 1978 vintage. And uh, I think that our Pinot Noir was about $9 uh, at that time. Yeah. And that was from the 77 vintage. So. And but you didn't have a tasting room, so you're selling it through like. No, a, we did have. A oh, tasting you did. Room. Oh. We we well, we didn't have a tasting room until 1981, but uh, that's when we built this building. But uh, we did open up to the public, um, you know, a couple times a year. Uh huh. Uh, down at the old barn. At the barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. But you know, like I think about the same back then as it is today, where you know only 10% of our wine we're actually selling at that retail price. Um, oh, the other 90% is essentially sold for half that retail price. So yeah, when you're talking about a $12 bottle of wine, it, for us it's really only $6 yeah. bottle of wine. But I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is like I'm asking that question of almost everyone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm picturing some kind of a chart or something like that through the years. Yeah. Uh, and so I need to have something that's common and if I ask some people retail and some people wholesale and things like that, yeah. then I don't know how to chart that. Right. Uh, because like some wholesale is 40, some 50. Um, and so if I just say, you know, whatever you sold it to the public for. Well, and I think, you know, the, the thing with, uh, with us now are that same Willamette um, Pinot Noir for us now sells for $29. But, and, and it really it's, it, you know, we're not trying to be snobby about it. And we're, we don't, you know, I don't have anything against, um, I enjoy buying wines for less money than that uh, but it's it's part of this finding out where you shine and finding out where Oregon shines and honestly it, Oregon just doesn't shine in that $12 price point because if you if you have to make all the uh, you have to have the yields in the vineyard and compromises in the winery to make a $12 wine and make it profitable uh, this isn't a good climate for you to grow grapes in yeah and uh, I I think it you know it starts uh, you know probably at the $20 price point where you can actually do the things necessary in this cool, cool climate to, to ripen grapes and, and to take care of them in the winery. Anything less than that, especially for red wines, it would be very difficult. Yeah. So you're not worried about two buck chucks coming in? and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that that could ever happen in Oregon and anybody oh, selling wine for super low prices, uh, uh, they just wouldn't be around because you wouldn't be able to financially make it. 
because it's such a marginal climate and the yields are so low. Yeah. And the farming costs are so high. Hmm, farming costs are high uh, compared to and why? Uh, mostly because of the hand labor it takes to um, grow grapes on these hillsides and to uh, grow quality Pinot Noir. A lot of the hand work, you're, it's not easily, um, you can't easily mechanize it. Uh -huh. And then all the, you know, we do over three thinning passes to adjust the crop level. And if you were in a, a warm climate on the valley floor, uh, lots of mechanization, they could probably grow grapes for a third the cost of what we do. Plus then their yields are higher because their climate's more forgiving. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, um, I think that uh, we just have to be uh, settled into the notion that we're going to have high farming costs, we're going to have to have low yields, therefore you should uh, shoot for the highest quality you can do. And, and there's things that we can do up here that they can't do in those warm climates, such as, you know, make fully flavorful Pinot Noirs. You can't do that on a, with a flatland farming, I yeah. don't think. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, Adam, that you said is like you said you were listening to your peers Pat, I want, I'd like to get your perspective on early on, like when you um, started, what was that like? I mean, you weren't, you weren't from an agricultural community, uh, you weren't from, you know, that kind of bent. All of a sudden you decided to, to do a vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, what, well, what was the... Well, actually, uh, I did grow up in a farm family, not oh, okay. a farm family here in the Willamette Valley, but uh, over in Hood River. Oh, okay. And uh, we grew um, apples, pears, and strawberries. Oh, okay. Uh, and that did influence me to want to go into some kind of farming, but um, of course, growing grapes is quite different than uh, growing uh, trees in an orchard. Um, but uh, in the early years, um, my dad was somewhat helpful with, uh, you know, uh, equipment. He really didn't know anything about growing grapes, but uh, he knew about growing plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he gave us some advice. We also, uh, you know, visited wineries and vineyards uh, here in Oregon. There weren't a lot of them. Yeah. And, uh, and then also in California and uh, Burgundy, France in uh, 1976 and um, and I think that you know we were always very good about asking a lot of questions and um, a lot a, a lot of what we did we did you know from the seat of our pants or by by the book I think Winkler uh, probably a lot of us were reading Winkler uh, who had uh, probably the best book on viticulture at that time uh -huh. And, uh, but we learned a lot from uh, some of the other people like uh, Dickie Rath and uh, Dave, well, not so much Dave Lett, but uh, Charles Corey, which you probably don't need, I mean, I'm, maybe a few people have mentioned him. I'll, I'm very familiar with him. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I wish that he was he, still alive. Yeah, he really was very helpful as far as uh, encouraging us to uh, go uh, to like a six by seven planting, which nobody really had done in Oregon at that time. Uh, and we bought a, a 48 foot, I mean 48 inch uh, crawler uh, that could go down the rows. Uh, and I think that was that was a really smart, smart advice on his part and smart that we took his advice. Uh -huh. uh, because you know, our vines, um, those vines are still um, alive and well and producing and um, and we're glad that they're at a six by seven uh, spacing rather than you know say a lot of people were going like eight by eight or I think at the times at the time it, the wider. vineyard was planted it was the highest density planted vineyard in Oregon certainly oh is that and so and what what a year did you start what, we what? started in 1974 74. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and and that was because Corey suggested he, he, to yeah uh, he suggested that he also encouraged us to uh, buy his plants of course which were the Pomar clone of Pinot Noir which we're still very very happy with that particular clone yeah uh, and so um, 
he also encouraged us to, to buy his Chardonnay, which wasn't very good, but um, we've since grafted that over the, the 108 Chardonnay. Uh -huh. So the root is the same, but you've grafted... Right. Uh, we grafted uh -huh. that to Pinot Gris. Uh -huh. yeah. And then I would say, uh, um, you know, we, we definitely kept in contact with our peers and, and we had meetings at the, you probably heard about the Tiger uh, Fire House, and, and um, that, was, that was always very informative and uh, we learned a lot by going to those meetings. Um, I'm kind of curious what that culture was like. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, meeting together, you know, potentially your competitors, uh -huh. but, uh, you know, you're early on in the, in the thing, uh, in, in, the, in the wine industry. I think there was a lot of tension there as far as the feeling, you know, like, okay, how many people can get into this and where are we going to sell all this wine? That we're making, uh -huh. uh, because you know, at that time there were, there was probably, I only really remember one, one wine shop in Portland, um, and uh, there were restaurants, of course, and the restaurants were very supportive, I think, of the industry from the very beginning. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but you know, there, uh, I remember <laughs> it's kind of a funny story, but. When we presented our very first wine, uh, at was at the Tiger Fire Hall. What year was that? That was uh, 1979. Uh -huh. And we, it's the very first wine that we presented in public. And I happened to be the one selected to present the wine to the group. And so we poured the wine around. There were about 25 people there uh, from all of the wineries that were here in Oregon at the time. and. Uh, uh, one of the winemakers from another winery, um, uh, you know, after he tasted the wine, he said, if it was my wine, I'd dump it down the drain. Oh. I mean, that was pretty hard to take. Yeah. But, um, oh. you know, the good thing that happened was that wine went on to win a gold medal um, at the Enological Society um, tasting in, in um, Seattle. So... Um, you know, we we thought it was a good wine, and yeah. uh, the judges up there thought it was a good wine. But uh, you know, I it was and very. It must have been hard. Yeah, it was hard. Must, I can <laughs> almost guess who that personality was. Well, you know, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> 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 uh, was it the contentious one? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I would say I, all I'll say is that, that UC Davis trained. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah. Okay. Uh, that's who I would guess the, uh, that, that was. But, but we, we boy, had encouragement from other people. Like we had, we got a phone call one night. Of, um, it was about eight o'clock at night, uh, and and someone had one of the other winemakers called us up and told us what a wonderful wine he thought our. I think oh, it was. Wow. I think it was our nineteen um, seventy nine recently. Uh -huh. and he just had tasted it and he thought it was wonderful, and so that was good. And he was UC Davis trained as well, but anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and then we got he, a call. He was one of the two original UC Davis yeah, trained. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But then we got a call uh, one night from, um, from someone in California, from I think it was Dunn Vineyards. Uh -huh. And uh, they said they had just tasted our 79 Pinot Noir, and that it, what a lovely wine they thought it was. And this was New Year's Eve. And uh, wow. we were, so, you know, it's like, I think there were there were some good things happening and there was also some negativity, but you know I think that's just the way it is in any industry. Uh, although I would say in our industry there's probably more helping and more support than a lot of industries. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. I, I hear that a lot mm -hmm. um, of people, you know, hey my something broke, you know, can uh -huh. I borrow yours? And uh, yeah, um, there I mean, was always that. Um, camaraderie as far as uh, being helpful and, and uh, I think uh, for the most part people were really really very kind to other people getting into the business. One of the things that I'm wondering from your perspective and then I'm going to ask Adam is at that time there wasn't really like a big you know Oregon wine industry 
I mean, you had to probably scrape for your for your clientele, and and you know, Oregon just was on the very budding stages of, of this whole thing. Talk a little bit about like your markets, and and um, I'm, I'm you know I'm sure that you know as an industry you have to kind of come together to to develop enough wineries and enough presence so mm-hmm. that there's something to talk about. Mm, definitely. I think that was probably our biggest problem when we were first starting is that uh, there was just a very small amount of wine. Um, and uh, at first we had uh, good support from a national um, company who uh, brokered uh, a lot of the wineries' wines. Uh, what, in, what, what company was it that? It was Robert Haas uh, oh. out of, uh, I think he was based in Connecticut then, but I think Somehow, I think he has his company is based out of Alabama. Uh, Alabama now. But it's called yeah. Vineyard Brands now. Yeah, Vineyard, Vineyard Brands. Brands. Yeah. So, uh, and he was he was very supportive in the beginning, but I think what happened was that uh, the industry started growing pretty quickly. We had a couple of really tough years weather-wise. That was like uh, in, in 80, the second part 81. of eighties. Oh, in early eighty and eighty-one. Okay. Um, that was 80 was a volcano so it was very cool here 81 we probably had the worst botrytis infection that i've ever seen in oregon uh, since we started growing grapes yeah um so those were two really tough years and i think uh, at that time we realized okay we've got to do this on our own i mean we cannot expect a national broker to sell these wines because they're not really up they're not really up to the quality that we need to have to sell them nationally. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, so I think a lot of us started working very hard on, on uh, doing our own marketing, uh, going out to trade shows starting about 1983, 84, um, and uh, getting into the New York market to try to taste people on the wines. And I, I know that uh, many of the wineries worked extremely hard on uh, trying to get the word out about Oregon. Uh, and I think it might it might have always been very hard and very difficult if it had been for some, um, I would say, Robert Druin coming in really, really mm-hmm. helped. Mm-hmm. Um, because then you had somebody with uh, a, a worldwide reputation who is, coming into this region, and, and it really did give our, our region a lot of uh, respect mm-hmm. that way. So maybe there was so, something there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I think all of us worked extremely hard. I mean, at, at one time, I think Dave Adelsheim was on the road, you know, like half the year, just trying to get out there and tell the story about Oregon and, and the wines and, and uh, the quality. and. Um, the style of Pinot Noirs we were making then. Uh, fortunately, we did have some, some good years uh, after that 81. I think we, we ended up having some very excellent years for several years in a row. Yeah, and did pretty well like in New York and some yeah. wine tastings uh-huh. and, and things and like then, that. And uh, then San Francisco also became a very important market for a lot of us. Um, we, we are fortunate to still have the same distributor there that we had way back in the early 80s. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Wow. And he he is incredibly well respected um, in the California and probably um, Nevada markets. I'm yeah. not sure, you know, probably nationally as well. I just don't know. He's He has a reputation for having a, an excellent palate. So he, he, I think, helped a lot of us in uh, getting our marketing going. And, he yeah. really believed in Oregon wines, which uh, it's hard to find distributors like that, especially when you're first getting started. And and that's because why did he believe in them? Uh, and or? why is it difficult? Both both oh. sides. Well, I think he believed he really believed in Oregon wines because he really thought that they had um, the um, kind of um, flavors and finesse 
that a lot of the, the great wines from Burgundy had. And uh, the, the fruit did or the, the actual wine did? The wine, uh -huh. the wine, yeah, the wines. Um, and then I think, um, what was the other half of that? Well, why is it hard for the other ones? And I think, you know, so many of the other ones, uh, you know, they are in the business of um, selling a product, which, you know, that works for us as well. Uh -huh. But I think that uh, it's always great when you can find someone that's truly passionate about uh, wine and Pinot Noir in particular. And yeah. this Tom yeah, in San Francisco is definitely that. And we, we seek out distributors like that because uh, um, they're just, um, they'll always remain motivated to uh, find out what you're doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, they're curious. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam was like, you know, kind of following up on that. It's like your mom has got, you know, it's like your parents have like these struggles of the, you know, finding the market and, and talk to me a little bit about your struggles or what the, the market is like for you. Well, I think that um, it's, it's just so much more of a developed um, industry now. And People know where Oregon is. You they, don't have to have a map. Yeah. And you don't have to start you know, from ground zero or to compare it to Burgundy or California or some other known quantity because certainly in the right circles, Oregon is a known quantity, so you don't have to compare it to another yeah. thing. And that's a great, you know, a great development. Um, we also, unlike the early days, um, it's definitely uh, completely true that there's no way we could sell all of our wine in Oregon. Uh, we sell... 80% um, of our wine outside of Oregon. Wow, 80%. Right. And so wow. to, uh, to do that, you have to uh, compete on a world stage in, um, you know, certainly New York and Chicago and places like that. But we sell wine in, in every state in the U.S. and in, wow. I think, eight different export markets. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice that it's a developed you know, industry that, that, uh, we can do that. But, uh, it also means that, um, you know, there's no falling back on, uh, and making wines that are good for Oregon. Uh -huh. That doesn't cut it anymore. I think no more local consumption. In the, right. In the early days, as long as it was a good, good wine for Oregon, you could find Oregonians to drink it because yeah. they're in general, I'd say Oregonians are pretty, uh, faithful to their local product. Uh, even more so now than I think in the past, but but there's just no way they could drink all the wine that we produce. So, uh, so how, you have how many to cases? Look. How many cases do you, are you going to do this year? Or? We'll do. Um, we do around forty thousand cases. Forty thousand. Yeah, give or take. Yeah. Depending on the year. Yeah. Um, so, um, I always tell people though that you know it took us thirty-five years to get to that point. So we're we're slowly working towards being what I would consider a a um, you know super premium medium sized brand for Oregon for Oregon that's actually a relatively uh, or a larger brand for yeah, Oregon I guess you'd Oregon. say yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I think we started out making uh, our first year was 1600 cases 1600 yeah 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 and yeah. I think when I when I came back and and uh, took an active role here at the winery I think we were doing about 15,000 cases so I think that a lot of that growth is, is that, you know, you have two generations growing this business and there was the first generation to build it up to 15 and then, you know, it was my role to, to have it, you know, essentially be a large enough business to, to be stable and to provide for two families, not just one. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a big step too. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of business. Uh... And I, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know whether... This might be a little bit off the subject, but I did want to get back to uh, what happened. Uh, Adam came in to the business and he started uh, helping with the vineyards and, um, and getting us on track with uh, the thinning and all of the, the handwork that had to be done in the vineyards. Uh, and then a, a couple years later, um, we let him make some of the decisions uh, about the winemaking. And, um, and I think that was very important for us to give that over uh, to Adam, because I think he had uh, 
fresh ideas about, okay, how can we make uh, better Pinot Noirs and, uh, you know, using different yeasts, uh, using, um, you know, malolactic bacteria to start uh, the secondary fermentation, uh, the cultures to start the secondary fermentation, uh, getting us to to write the checks for all those French oak barrels and all of the things that we needed to do to make better wine. Yeah. Uh, which I think, uh, for Joe and I, we we had always made pretty good wine, and so we were pretty happy with, okay, this is the way it's going, and we are doing this uh -huh. thinning, and the wines are still good, but I think, you know, to take it to the next level, uh, I think I have to give Adam a lot of credit for, uh, you know, doing the research it took to uh, figure out, okay, what what are the best yeasts, and what do we use about, oh, how many different yeasts do we use now for all of our wines? Yeah. 10 to 15. And 10 to 15. I mean, and where we would probably, in, in the early years, we were using one yeast for Pinot Noir. Uh, so for, for all of them? Uh, for all of them. It, maybe for all of them, we would be using four or five different yeasts. Uh -huh. uh, we, but uh, I think the fact that you bring in um, different yeasts, uh, you can just get different flavors that are going to be adding to the whole picture. Of, yeah. of, the, of the wine. So how many do we use for Pinot Noir? How many different? Probably 10. 10 different ones for Pinot Noir, which yeah. is pretty amazing. And then probably another yeast for each of the other uh, varieties, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Just a one thing you're doing to help build complexity in the wine. Uh -huh. you know, I don't think it's the most important thing we do, but I think that uh, it's definitely one of the winemaking tools that you, you're crazy if you don't use. Yeah. So Pat, I'm kind of curious too. It's like at that transitional moment when you're you're thinking, okay, Adam, let's 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 bring him a little bit more into that role. Tell me a little bit about like your feelings. It's like what, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Um, you know, it was very very hard. <laughs> in in what way? Well, it was very hard to uh, give up control. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, not only for myself, but for Joe as well, I think that, uh, you know, you have things that you've been doing a certain way um, for so many years, and uh, to go ahead and, and decide, okay, well, there are different ways to do things, and, and uh, there can be changes made. Um, I think it, it was hard, it was hard for me, and it was hard for me also not to just want to try to micromanage and just say, okay, well, you know, this isn't the way we used to do this as far as, you know, maybe stacking a pallet or whatever, uh -huh. uh, you know, just little things. Yeah. And uh, so I think um, for us, we just, we just uh, had to um, kind of just get away from the winery quite a bit and just to allow Adam to to do to work with our employees the way that he approached working with employees instead of the way we might have approached it uh -huh. and um, and I would have to say that uh, uh, even though I, I think we always did a very good job with our employees I think that you know Adam's taken it to a whole other level um, as far as the way the business uh, in of course, we would not be able to be selling 40,000 cases of wine now if he hadn't, you know, taken it to that other level where he uh, probably hired more salespeople than we would have hired yeah. uh, and probably uh, raised prices as we needed to have them raised. We would probably have been a little bit afraid to do that. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, I think for us, we just, we just had to say, okay, we just have to look the other way and, and get out of his hair and let it go, right? <laughs> and Adam, what were your feelings like like during those? What was, what was, I, I'm trying to picture like how many years like that transition, but you've got like the vineyard transition, then you've got the winemaking transition. I'd say it, overall it was probably from 94 to 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. so there, I think there was a good five years of you know, me kind of um, taking more and more responsibility and... and uh, for for first the vineyard and then the winemaking and and then finally you know managing 
uh, the whole project. And I think, you know, I can imagine it being very tough to, you know, for my folks to give up control over uh, this, not only because they have a lot emotionally invested in, in the brand and the property and the, the project, but, uh, um, you know, their whole life savings, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're, a, a, um, we, we finance our growth, um, you know, through bank loans. So there was a lot writing on it being successful. It's not like this was a, uh, you know, a second, uh, career, uh, you know, folly for them. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, you know, their whole, um, life and, and everything is tied up in here. So, um, I appreciate that, that it was, you know, it would be hard, but also if you have someone that is, uh, is, uh, that has the skill to take that on, which I think, you know, I did, um, the only way to, uh, keep them, uh, he, you know, motivated and, and, uh, and uh, here as an employee is to give them control, and and that's what they, you know, we kind of came to this conclusion that that uh, I had to have um, a lot of say over all those different aspects. Otherwise, it wasn't my project. It wasn't something that I would take on. Yeah. And uh, and you I, probably would have gone to work for another winery, you know, if we hadn't been willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Or started um, your own. Yeah, there's too many, you know, great opportunities for people that that have skills in this business to uh -huh. to not. It had to be a good situation for both of us. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm I'm trying to pic picture those moments. It's like you know, like there there might have been some tension, some you know, then letting go, and then tension again. And, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We. Uh, I don't think we. Uh, any of us ever came to blows, but we definitely had uh, we had a lot of discussions back then. Yeah, I was probably fired quite a few times. Oh, were you? <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what what always you know at the end of the day, and it was a very short firing. Uh, <laughs> by the end of the day, I think that they realized and I realized that our our kind of conflict was only about wanting to make this place great, and so. You know, you can't fault the other person for just wanting to do uh, a great job and to make, you know, a great product and stuff like that. So I think that's why at the, you know, when we did have conflicts at the end of the day, I think we kind of relaxed and realized that, you know, we're all working towards the same goal here. And uh, it's just, you know, how to get from A to B. Right. Just small disagreements about, you know, maybe what yeast you might use or what... Uh uh, whether we should buy a new bottling line or, you know, uh, I forget w what else we were buying back then. We did buy a new bottling line not too long after you came on, I think. Yeah. And, and whose call was that one? Um, I, you know, I, my parents were always really supportive about buying new equipment and, and I think that I just had to give them the confidence that, uh, we were going to pay for it through, um, you know, making uh, wine that more production that was higher quality that we could sell for more money. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I remember more conflicts early on when maybe they weren't as confident about my abilities, and that once uh, once I had quite a few a few years under my belt, and that we uh, were seeing you know uh, seeing things. Uh, turn around in the market and, and, you know, have success and, and, uh, have these things get paid for, then, uh, they were, uh, very supportive. <laughs> yeah. Um, boy, just a lot of questions here. Pat, um, what does it take to make a great bottle of wine? Oh, well, I think you have, you have to start with soil and climate first, probably climate first and then soil, uh, and then uh, good plant material uh, has to be the one of the clones that, that would be do well on that, on that soil in that climate. And, um, and then you just have to 
manage those those great plants um, per, almost perfectly because otherwise you're not you're not you're going to be getting too many grapes from those plants uh, and that and that won't work at all uh, you'll have a thinner weaker wine um, and you know in the early years mother nature often determined okay how many grape vine or how many tons we were going to get per acre and we got some small tonnage but every once in a while you get mother nature would be very kind and you get all these grapes and uh -huh. then those were the years that were that were probably more difficult uh, and because you had well to... because we were getting too many too much tonnage per acre and so the wines were not as um, as rich and full-bodied and flavorful yeah. as as they should have been then I think you uh, you actually do have to I think age that one age the wine with Pinot Noir you have to age it in in a very very good uh, probably French or Oregon oak maybe that I don't know if people are having any success with any other kinds of like Eastern European oak mm -hmm. but uh, you do have to spend a lot of money on barrels because mm -hmm. you cannot make a good Pinot Noir I don't think in stainless steel. To, to match up to the world quality, worldwide uh, expectation of quality Pinot Noir. Uh, so that's Pinot Noir, but of course then we, we aren't talking very much about the uh, white grapes but, um, and the white wines, but I think with the white wines, from my perspective, you still have to start with the soil and the climate, uh, but then you have a little more leeway on crop level, you can get a little larger crop. Uh, but when you bring those grapes into the winery, then you, you have to try to keep the flavors as fresh as possible. So that's why we ferment um, our white wines in, in stainless steel for the most part. Uh -huh. I mean, almost 99% 90, 90 probably. Uh, and and uh, I, I think for Pinot Gris also, it's, it's very important not to take, and I don't know if Adam agrees with me, but not to take the fermentation completely to the, to the very end of dryness, but to leave, you know, maybe uh, a fourth of a percent or a half a percent of sugar in, in that uh, wine, because otherwise the fruit tends to go away. Uh -huh. And that's you say Pinot With Gris, Pinot or? Gris, Pinot okay. Gris. Mm -hmm. and uh, and I would say Riesling and uh, Pinot Blanc, the, the the white wines that we make. Yeah. Um, and then I think probably the yeast is very important too with those wines. And keeping that, um, you know, not allowing any oxidation to happen to those wines. Or just if you do have any oxidation, just a tiny, tiny bit of. Well, you use a technique now where you bubble air, a bubble CO2 up through the wine, right? Which we never did in the beginning, but I think uh, it seems to give just a slight bit of oxidation, right? That's the white wines? The white yeah, wines. I actually do it for red and white. Just, you know, yeast need, um, to keep the yeast happy, you, you know, they definitely need sugar and nutrients and they also need oxygen, otherwise they'll be unhappy and that's not good for fermentation. <laughs> yeah. And so Adam, same question for you. What does it take to make a great bottle of wine? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, definitely all those nuts and bolts things, like my mom was saying, but I think that, you know, you're not really going to make a great wine unless um, you are, um, I think, passionate about wine, and uh, because then you'll... Um, You'll find every last little thing you can do to increase quality if you want to make a wine that, that you really want to drink. And even at our production level, I still kind of am guided by that philosophy that, that I mean, I really love wine and, and I want to make wines that I like to drink. And um, the hope is that, you know, you can find enough consumers out there that have a similar taste in wine. Uh, but... Um, 
Because I, I think otherwise you won't make the fullest expression or the best example of that type of wine unless you're kind of making it for your own table a bit mm -hmm. and then uh, and then finding customers from there, yeah. I think. And, and for me, that's really, um, you know, obviously 80, 90 percent of our thought, you know, and and your work as a winemaker in Oregon goes into making Pinot Noir because that's by far the most important uh, grape varietal and it's what we're all here to be doing. Um, and so I do a lot of work thinking about how to make that great bottle of Pinot Noir. Um, and then I like making uh, white wines that I like to drink, uh, Alsatian varietals, fresh, crisp, you know, great summer wines, and uh -huh. Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, probably a lot of what, what you're talking about, Adam, with the Pinot Noir is just the, the huge amount of care that you have to give to those wines when they're aging and uh, when you're moving them, moving yeah. the wines, and which you do mostly by nitrogen uh, pumping, right? Yeah, use gravity or nitrogen pressure to move the wines and, yeah, constantly thinking of how to make that wine better and you know that's one of the great things I think about Pinot Noir is in particular uh, and you know certainly true in Oregon is that I always say you know the best quality Pinot Noir in Oregon next year the, the absolute finest out of the thousand that are made you know it, it might be made in a really fancy facility and and uh, with fancy equipment but it could almost just as easily be made in a garage somewhere in Carlton or up here on this hill or um, and that's because it's kind of the great equalizer as far as varietals go um, the equipment uh, can all be replicated with very low technique low um, low technique kind of equipment and uh, you know then it kind of comes down to who has the best vineyard site who takes care of the, the vineyards the best because you can you know replicate gravity with a forklift you don't need four levels of winemaking uh, space to, to do gravity, you can do it just as easily, uh, you know, in a garage or under a tent or anywhere. And uh, so then it really comes down to who can get the best quality grapes. And, uh, and that's kind of exciting to me because, um, you know, through whether it's through sourcing from bought-in fruit or, or now, you know, we have five different sites around the valley that we're going to try to grow those best quality grapes. In any given year, I feel like I have just as much shot at making the best wine in Oregon and and certainly um, you could say in Oregon that uh, if you're making the, the best quality Pinot Noir in Oregon that might be the best quality Pinot Noir made that year in the world because I think that um, in any given year the best Pinot in the world could be from Oregon or it could be from Burgundy maybe from New Zealand maybe from California um, there's lots of Lots of great spaces to do that in, and, and uh, then it kind of comes down to who, who does the work and who has that best soil and exposure and sight out there. Yeah. Pat, did you ever think that, you know, like someone could actually say that when you were starting out? That No. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, uh, I think that we have come a long way from where, where we were in, in the very beginning of... Uh, when this industry started, I mean, it, uh, it it is it is truly gratifying to hear um, Adam's passion for the grape. And I think you know, in the beginning, we all thought, oh, well, let's just let's just hope we can make some wine that'll sell. <laughs> and, and we think we have a good grape variety for this climate, and we think our soils are good. But you know, let's just see what we can do and make it sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me. It's like that, that's a relatively a short period of time. You know, 30, 40 years uh, where all that has happened, where Oregon has become world class. And so, like, in going forward, what do you think the Oregon wine industry, will it last as long as, like, the French wine industry has lasted? Um, you know, like, there's a lot of changes going on. Uh, big wineries buying, you know, in. Big money from California coming in. Um, uh, what's your thought about, you know, the future, looking out 30, 50 years? Well, I'm pretty excited, I think. Um 
you know, we're poised to, to uh, you know, make even greater strides in winemaking and, and success as, as businesses. Um, it's interesting, you know, um, sometimes I think about, oh, gosh, which is the best vineyard site in Oregon? You know, is it, you know, Roosevelt or Shea Vineyard or, um, you know, something over in Dundee? And, and then I think, gosh, we planted so little of our potential great vineyard sites in Oregon that I kind of think, you know, if you have to ask that question, probably the best vineyard site in Oregon hasn't been planted yet. And, uh, um, you know, because we've just kind of scratched the surface of great vineyard sites. I think we're, you know, people are experimenting with higher elevations and steeper grades, and, and uh, we're certainly looking to, you know, double our vineyard acreage in the next five years, all on what might be the best best vineyard site in Oregon? We don't know. Yeah. And uh, and so that's exciting. I think when you you know you talk to you know, friends and acquaintances and uh, in Burgundy and and uh, all the sites are you know they're all taken and mm -hmm. and uh, you know you can make your little area as good as you can make it, but uh, you know, there's certainly no no chance that there's uh, this wide open. Uh, Thing we have here which is yeah that there's lots of gr potentially great vineyard sites and new soils and so yeah. i'm probably i'm excited going forward i think in investment in oregon so far we've been really lucky with with uh um you know the druins they're kind of you know the ideal uh family the best i think probably the best um burgundian family that you could ask for to come in and do something in oregon uh just because there's you know so um, they're definitely well financed, but they're also uh, really respectful, and and they've been great neighbors, and and uh, great for uh, promoting all of Oregon, not just their little slice of it. And uh, I think the folks from that have bought Erath are are going to be uh, really good in a different way, mm -hmm. just being um, very much a big business that that uh, is in the business of promoting. Uh, um, wines from each area that they own wineries in, and um, I don't, I don't see any any downside. I, I kind of our uh, little area out here in Yamhill Carlton um, is maybe a little more down home than some of the other areas, and I like that personally. Uh, but all all big projects and big investments, as long as they're here to to make high quality wine and promote. Oregon, in addition to their own thing, I'm, I'm, so, you know, I'm all for welcoming them. Yeah. What about you, Pat? What, well, what do you see, like, looking out in the future? Um, I'm, I'm much more hopeful. I have to admit, after the election, uh, uh. with the solving, of, hopefully, solving of the the major 37 debacle. And what um, was it that concerned you about the 37? Well, I think that. Uh, if, if you think about, uh, Oregon has probably the best land use planning of any state in, in the Union. Uh, and if we hadn't had that good land use planning that started in, in 1974, uh, a lot of the really excellent vineyard sites probably would be five acre parcels with uh, you know, a small house or a double wide on them. In, in Yamhill County and uh, in parts of Washington County and Polk County. Uh, and so <clears throat> if we were to go the other way, I think that a lot of potentially good vineyard sites could, could uh, be ruined. I mean, and actually some of our, some of our, the people in, in the wine industry uh, were hoping probably to do that. Um, to do what? To divide their land up, and and uh, and they had applied applied for a bench of thirty seven relief, uh -huh. um, which oh, is too bad. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you know, we I'm much more hopeful now because uh, if we don't have if we don't have the land, um, there's there's no way it can happen. Yeah. And uh, and not that we have to grow hugely or be be gigantic, but uh, there's still a lot of really excellent sites out, like Adam was saying, that 
out there that it, it would just be a shame if, if they were to have become houses or small developments um, yeah. and couldn't have become maybe the best raspberry field or the, you know, the best organic farm or, or uh, the best vineyard. But I'm, I'm much more hopeful now. Um, and as far as I think, the commitment of the people in the industry, a lot of the young people who have come in in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, I, I'm just so impressed Com with it, it, commitment impress to making good wines, uh -huh, okay. commitment to growing good grapes. And, uh, you know, I think, for the most part, it's it's just fantastic. So they're they're more committed to making good wine rather than just a business. It's just a business to produce mm -hmm. a two buck chuck. Yeah, yeah, I think so for the most part. I, I don't know. I haven't heard about any big pro. I mean, there are some big projects going on, but um, you know the the Calpers projects. But I think I, everybody's f focused on the same goal, though, which is to you know, promote Oregon on the world stage as making super high quality Pinot Noir, definitely, and white varietals as well, uh, to a little lesser extent. And yeah, I think there's still a lot of, um, there's still a lot of, you know, small projects that I think kind of infuse a passion as well. That's kind of nice too, that, you know, uh, people uh, coming up to, um, to be assistant winemakers here in Oregon that are going to eventually start their own small project and be doing high quality, mm -hmm. you know, pushing the envelope on, on what you can do. I think we've really barely scratched the surface, too, on uh, the potential uh, worldwide market uh, as an industry, don't you? Yeah, we get, sometimes we rely, I think, you know, the U.S. is such an amazing wine-consuming mm -hmm. um, place, you know. Um, that maybe we we don't pay as much attention to export as we should. Yeah, uh, we're we're definitely doing a lot more work in terms of export to not only f to expand markets but to um, promote yourself on the world stage, not just here on so your we're, home we're, turf. What will it take to to do that? That uh, then you're competing against you know the big time, you know the guys that have been doing. Yeah, for I mean we feel. We feel confident. I mean, we, you know, we, you're, in some ways you're already doing that in places like New York and Boston. And, you're, you know, from a quality standpoint, you're competing on the world stage. Um, but, yeah, when you, you know, when you sell wine in the U.K. or Japan, it's, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of people that have, you know, if you're a New Zealand wine producer, uh, there's no way they can sell all their wine in New Zealand. They have to export, and they've just been really savvy about it. And um, I, I would like to see Oregon kind of jump on that and be more savvy about export and you know Shirley uh, has done an amazing job of pushing us to mm -hmm. think beyond the 48 mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and you know who knows maybe uh, um, you know once there's a little pressure from the uh, you know the, the I, I think right now it's just the, the national market in the U.S. is just still really expanding for a good quality Pinot Noir. Yeah. But once there might be a little bit more pressure and, and the expansion might not be quite as easy, then I think... We might, might appreciate those export markets a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> I know I did, um, I had some dealings to do with an attorney in California, in Napa, California. And he said, don't pay me in cash, pay me in Oregon Pinot. Okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so that, that, that was really yeah. insightful. That was like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you guys are doing, you know, doing something. Well, yeah. I think, about marketing. I think that uh, we're we're still positioned pre pretty well too, as far as price. I think if you compare prices of Oregon Pinot Noirs compared to like prices of, of good quality um, California Pinot Noirs, Pinot Noirs, we're still we're still a little low, quite a bit lower than they are. Uh -huh. And then, you know, certainly high quality, you know, anything really good um, from Burgundy now is just an amazing, it's in the, you know, $80 plus category now, especially with the Euro being uh -huh. so strong. 
Well, I was going to say, it's like right now, America is an incredible, for export, incredibly good position because our dollar is so, so weak yeah. compared to the, to the euro. And you guys yeah. should be sending bottles over there. We should. Yeah, although it, right it's now. interesting too because it, uh, it helps us get into those markets, which that's what we're looking at is like, okay, now's the time, strike while the iron's hot, let's get, a, get uh, established there. But by the same token, it also helps us in the domestic market because our competitors are a lot more expensive now. True. So it's kind of like it's easy to just kind of say, oh, well, you, you know, domestic competition's not as great, so we'll just sell it all here. Uh, so it's kind of, you got to really, um, I think, be thinking for the future to spend the money to do export because it is expensive. It's more expensive to sell wine overseas than it is in your home market. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What advice would you give um, to somebody that, uh, how, let's see, maybe I'll ask it in a different way. Um, how, uh, what advice would you give me to, uh, like about tasting um, wine? H how do I taste wine? How should I taste wine when I go into a tasting room or? Do you wanna? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I think, Approaching it um, maybe less from a um, sometimes people think they have to deconstruct the wine uh, to understand it, and they need to say, "Oh, this Pinot Noir has you know cherry and raspberry and some chocolate and mocha and and that's those things are really helpful, especially as a winemaker and as a um, if you're comparing different areas, if you're a really motivated consumer and you, but um, I don't know, I really think people should uh, kind of fall back on do they like it, uh -huh. does it taste good, and uh, then I think one of the easier things to do is to say, well, what kind of foods does it go with, and uh, you know, it certainly makes it a richer experience to have it with food, and, and uh, um, it's kind of how I think most folks, uh, winemakers, would like to see their wines in, in that is paired with food, food. Uh -huh. and and I think it's also just a little easier because I think you can get kind of caught up in the deconstructing of a wine, and and then you kind of lose sight of the fact that it's just a lovely product, and uh -huh. you don't need to you know analyze exactly what this or that is, and. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest examples is that um, sometimes wines, um, they, a flaw to one person is good to the next. Mm. And, you know, you kind of don't want to, um, I, I, a consumer doesn't need to analyze a wine uh, like a winemaker would. He shouldn't feel like he needs to be able to pick out every last little thing uh, if it's a, uh, just a small part of the wine and maybe you enjoy that part of it and you should yeah. just run with it <laughs> yeah I think uh, I would just encourage people to get out uh, visit the wineries in their local region and, and then try to you know visit you know other other regions as well and uh, just taste and see what they like and then take home a few bottles and try it with food at home yeah. see if you still like it and uh, if, if you do, then, then you know where to go to get more. And if you want to get farther into it, I think an easy thing, too, and I find it still very interesting and probably the most interesting uh, as far as comparisons go is to compare different wines from different soils or areas. And we certainly have that in Oregon with the new kind of smaller AVAs. They were split up, and some better than others, to kind of highlight different styles and qualities of wine that come from... Not, not so much from climate, but primarily from soil. And our area in Yamhill Carlton is, for the most part, sedimentary soil, 90% or something. And those wines are definitely different than the wines from Dundee. Uh, we buy grapes from uh, Dundee area, and uh, um, I really like the wines from there. But they're totally different than the wines we produce over here. And, and uh, people should just, you know, I think it's an interesting comparison. And then they can decide if they like kind of our sedimentary soils, which I think is more black fruit and bigger, brawnier style and a little earthy and, and uh, um, 
or the Dundee style, which I think is more red cherry and brightness of fruit and, and kind of sappy and, you know, both are very viable styles. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I would enjoy making both styles, uh, but um, it's fun, I think, for consumers to compare. It's fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the great thing about wine is it doesn't taste the same, you know, it's, you know, I always think about beer and that's the whole goal with beer is to make every bottling taste the same as the last one, you know, as far as if you're making an IPA, you always want that IPA to taste the same. And yeah. For us with wine, it's, it's, you know, what the year gives you, what the soil gives you. Yeah, that's all, that's part of the charm. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, I asked this um, of Adam, it's like, you've been in the industry for for a while mm -hmm. what um, you know what has the vineyard taught you you know about life you know what kind of perspective has it has it given you well I guess I guess it's probably um, kind of taken me on a path that has brought me you know, closer and closer and closer to um, nature. Mm -hmm. And so I find that a lot of the things I do in my spare time now are, are things that involve um, trees and plants and birds. And, and, um, and then I've just um, started uh, on as a board member with Portland Audubon, and, and that's very important work to me. And a lot of it is the conservation part of what that organization does. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think that um, being kind of close to uh, growing things, growing plants and, and uh, in the vineyard, has probably taken me even closer to in my avocation, and, and certainly I guess with the works in the in the gardens here at the winery, uh, I, I probably never really envisioned myself to being that attached kind of to huh. uh, to nature, but um, it's definitely taken me that direction, and uh, and also being really concerned about taking care of of the soils here uh, in in the vineyards. And, um, and I'm very pleased that I think we have an excellent program here that, that Adam and, and our vineyard manager, Travis, have set up with, you know, cover crops and, and uh, mulching them into the soil and trying to get away from using uh, nitrogen uh, fertilizers. Um, and, so I think all, all of those things have been, it's very satisfying to me and, uh, and very enriching for my life. Um, so I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm always kind of curious because like when you do something for a while, it's like you have to walk away with some lessons. Yes. And so I'm just kind of curious what those lessons you know, are, and that's, that's really interesting. I mean, and even when you went to pa uh, Patag uh, Argentina, Argentina, you were going down there to look at the birds. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then I think it's, it's also probably been good for me as far as uh, teaching me uh, maybe tolerance and patience and, and realizing that uh, you, you, this is what I hope will be a generational business and, and uh, that, you know, perhaps someone from Adam's family or one of our other children's family will uh, continue with this business. And uh, I think it's something that's very, very difficult to do in a short period of time. Uh, and well, I think what's that, difficult you know, to do? It's difficult to, to um, do everything you want to do with a vineyard and winery project. In, in a few short years, in, in one generation. So that's, um, that's why I'm very happy that, you know, ours, um, you know, because Adam has come into the business, is, is a multi-generational um, uh, winery and vineyard, because I think it's, I, I don't see why we won't be making improvements and changes over the next, um, well, till 
So I'm gone, right? Yeah. And uh, it would be a shame too, I think. Uh, we know a lot of people who who did sell their wineries and vineyards, and and uh, and for some of them, the reason was because they didn't have a family member that wanted to uh, continue. Yeah. And so I'm I'm very very pleased that uh, that wasn't the case with us. And, and that I'm able to kind of benefit in not only financially, because this is our retirement, but also, uh, you know, be a part of, of the changes that have happened here uh -huh. at, at Elk Cove and with the Oregon wine industry. Yeah. And so now you can actually um, let like all those tense moments uh, go to the wayside. You can look back and you can see, hey. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is, you know, like probably the question I should have asked you first. But what was it like? What siren called you to, um, you know, to do this winemaking stuff, this vineyard stuff? Well, that's kind of hard to know. Um, I, uh, when Joe and I moved back to Oregon, that was 1972. From from um, well, we were in, in South Dakota for two years. Um, and we actually made wine out of um, some of the wild fruit there, and we enjoyed that very much. Uh -huh. And then when we uh, lived in San Francisco, uh, because of the wineries being very, very close uh, to the to the Bay Area where we lived, uh, we visited wineries and vineyards, and uh, also got involved in a few wine tastings, uh, and it was pretty remarkable. Uh, one tasting I remember in particular was a tasting of white burgundies and uh, and it was quite uh, amazing to me that there could be such a difference between the wines from the different uh, wineries in the different regions. Uh -huh. And uh, and then, um, so then when we moved back to Oregon, um, we started thinking about, okay, we, we both enjoyed gardening. Uh, I thought, well, okay, maybe we want to garden on a bigger scale and, uh -huh. and buy some property. And uh, we weren't really thinking of winemaking at that time. But uh, after we bought this property, uh, we started thinking about it because that seemed to be one of the crops that people were growing. Wow, so when you brought, bought this property, right. it wasn't we with the intent of... Not, not necessarily. Uh, no, we were thinking about wow. growing some kind of crop, and whether it was would be berries or um, organic vegetables or whatever, we weren't sure. But I mean, I guess it didn't take us very long to figure out that the land that we had bought, being on a hillside and having no real source of irrigation water, that probably grapes were a good bet. Uh huh. And uh, so then we started really only a few months later started talking to Charles Corey about um, you know buying some plants from him for the fall and spring yeah ordering a tractor and I guess it didn't take us very long <laughs> <laughs> huh that's interesting I'm, yeah. I'm really surprised that you bought this land mm -hmm. you know with, with uh, without having thought about yeah. uh, you know what you were going to plant and then and then figuring out well you know, grapes will do nice. I guess we were trying to keep open-minded a little bit. Um, we'd actually looked for property in Hood River because we were living in Hood River at the time. Uh -huh. And um, and we were actually thinking about grapes in Hood River, but then... Really? We, but when we came over here, we thought, well, we'll, we'll be open-minded and think about, well, what, what we want to do. But Yeah. Fantastic. Is there anything else that um, that I need to know for... Um, like this book, and this book again is like, um, you know, people from Indiana are going to be reading it, as well as people from Oregon, you know, are going to be reading it. Um, well, some of the things I think are interesting relating to the, when these guys, you know, started planting here, is I think at the time there was only about 200 acres of grapes in all of Oregon, uh -huh. and I think when you planted first grapes here, have yeah. you tasted any wine from Oregon? Uh, maybe one you commercial know, wine. <laughs> it was very hard to find any wine to taste from uh -huh. Oregon. We actually did buy a case of wine, a 
case of Pinot Noir from Charles Coury from the 1973 vintage. And uh, I remember the day I went up there to the winery and he, he brought the, the uh, case of wine out and uh, I had to wait while he applied all the labels to, to the bottle and put, and put the foils on. And, uh, and uh, then we, it was actually a very, very excellent Pinot Noir. Uh, but, you know, the, all the, like the, um, even the wines that came a little bit later, like the, the famous wines from 1976 that did so well in the Paris tasting. 75. Or it was 75. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we never were able to get them and taste them. I mean, it was like they would be sold out so quickly that, you know. Just well, they were tiny productions. Tiny. And, yeah, I always think it's interesting to think about planting <clears throat> 10 acres of grapes, which in today's dollars is a lot of money to do that without having tasted, I mean, a real leap of faith, in other mm -hmm. words, where now you can taste wines from every, you yeah. know, little area and your neighbors and lots That's of commercial really, examples. really good <laughs> point. Yeah, we were just, uh, just really, I think all of us, we felt, I felt at that time, I'm involved in this big, huge experiment. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I hope it's good. And I, and, uh, but I think we all felt that way. We just, I mean, nobody knew whether the wines were really going to be excellent. Uh, we had an idea that the climate should be better for Pinot Noir than what they had where they were growing it in California at that time because they were growing Pinot Noir in some very hot, mm -hmm. hot uh, places. And, and certainly they've, they've improved a lot by finding cooler places now. Um, they've improved their wine quality a lot. But and, 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 you know, the meetings we had at the firehouse, oh, it was just like, it, it's almost laughable. I, I was on one of the committees, the, I think it was the marketing, you know, committee or thinking about marketing. And, uh, and we met, we, we did our little meetings of four or five of us at this Chinese restaurant and, and, and everybody was ordering beer. And I says, you know, we can't be ordering beer. We have to order wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Red, white, or pink. Maybe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Just to, to get people thinking about, okay, yeah. wine. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that's interesting when you think about the early days. And then also um, just the only thing about this property in particular is that it was the first vineyard and winery in um, what's now the Yamhill Carlton District. Uh. And I think maybe the second vineyard that was planted on sedimentary soils, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe Dickie Rat's first vineyard was mm -hmm. yeah, on sedimentary. Dick, Dick, Dick's was. Um, so, you know, um, I think it's interesting from a historical perspective, and then it kind of um, says something about, you know, what I get to work with, which is these nice old vines from yeah. a really what's kind of grown around us to be a really renowned area for growing grapes. <laughs> Pat, when you when when you were planting, did you know what t soil type you had here? Or? Um, well, actually, we did. We had our soil tested, and, and the uh, the uh, soil conservation district uh, for Yamhill County they mapped all of the soils. Uh, so you know, you, so you already had it mapped. Yeah, wow. it was mapped, and I'm trying to remember what year they wow. did that. But they have maps of all the soils of of almost every farm property in Yamhill County. And so we knew that we were on a different soil. It wasn't Jory. And uh, most of, actually, uh, our friends were growing on Jory at that time. Uh -huh. But uh, we figured it was well-drained, uh, prune trees, I mean, plum trees had grown here. Because uh, we did clear some of the small uh, plum orchards that we had. And so we knew that probably the, the grapes would do well on this soil. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's so funny because we we had another fellow. He was he was a grape grower. I think he's he's gone now. But um, he came up and visited our property one time, and and I don't know. He had this kind of mistaken notion. He says, you know, you can't grow grapes here because there's a river that's going under this property, and and I don't know where he got that idea. I guess from the soil maps and and. Uh, and you know how it would be way too wet, and but you know, huh. it's been fine. 
it's been fine. But I think that it is, it is a probably with the soil type we have, there's less topsoil, but it's the grapes can go deeper. Uh -huh. the, the, vine, the roots can go deeper into this soil yeah. than Jory, where Jory is usually, you have more topsoil, but yet um, you get down to bedrock, uh -huh. uh, you know, after three or four feet. Yeah. So uh, it's just it's just a different type, and I think he just was under the mistaken notion that no, oh, this is sedimentary soil, and there's there's rivers going on underneath. Wow, it. That's You'll never be able to grow grapes. I mean, that just shows the really how little we knew. Yeah. Yeah. But another funny story is we went um, to the Benson, um, the London Grill, for dinner one time, uh -huh. and uh, and you know we were I was probably our first or second year of growing grapes out here. And uh, so we told the wine steward that we had a you know small vineyard we just planted out here. And he said, oh, he said, no, you can't grow, you can't grow uh, European varieties here because the minute you put them on the soil, they're going to revert back to the American variety. <laughs> so, but it was just like, there was a whole lot of ignorance uh, at the time. and. Uh, <laughs> and it, fortunately, I think, uh, and, and I remember somebody saying, I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody said Riesling instead of Riesling. <laughs> and of course, nobody knew how to pronounce Pinot Noir, but I think it's amazing how the industry grew and educated the people around them and educated um, other people about Oregon and it's... Uh, but it was it was pretty funny back then in those years. Yeah, one of the things that I find pretty interesting um, is here, especially in the northern Willamette uh, Valley, is the people that came here um, in that pioneer post-prohibition uh, period all seem to be very well educated, and that seemed to kind of make a difference. Like when you had to go to the legislature, when you you know, had to go to the county. Um, mm -hmm. To do you know different kinds of uh, uh, you know of things, you know, and, and I I grew up actually in Napa, and um, I had a bunch of farmer people that were next to me, and some of those people would never be able to go to the state legislature mm -hmm. to get something done. Yeah, I I think that we were probably fortunate that we all. Uh, many of us had very good educations and uh, were pretty savvy about how things worked and um, and I think that you know also pretty uh, forward thinking with the labeling laws uh, and I think I uh, probably have to give Dave Adelschein most of the credit there I mean he certainly spearheaded that uh, and, uh, and that's you're referring to, you know, like 100% of the right. the grapes. Yeah, say 90% of the grape has to be of the variety that's on the label, yeah. with the exception of Cabernet, which can be 75. At, I think at the time it was only 50, the national, 51% is what you had to have. Yeah. It's since increased. Um, but Oregon still has the toughest labeling requirements, which is, you know, I think it, it mainly just... We want to put forth that notion that, you know, if you're making wine here, you're really, you know, doing your best to, to protect the integrity of, of the wine. And for Pinot Noir in particular, where all high-end Pinot Noir in Oregon is 100% varietal anyway, at 90% is pretty easy. It's, you know, you can, yeah. you can attain that. <laughs> I think it was very important for our industry and, and for getting us started that, you know, we... Well, it set the tone to, for people knowing that, you know, you're gonna make wine here and take the high road and and try to do, you know, high quality. And I think the other the other part of the labeling laws that was good was not being able to use uh, names from other wine regions uh, for your for your wine, like Johannesburg Riesling or Champagne uh -huh. or Burgundy or Bordeaux, um, Chianti, whatever. Uh, and I think that that I think set us apart as well because at that time there were a lot of uh, wineries all all across the country, well New York and, and uh, California mostly that were calling their red wines Burgundy or, um, 
Johannesburg Riesling. I think yeah. there was only one person that was grandfathered in on that uh, Johannesburg Riesling thing, and, and uh, they're no longer uh, making wine. But you know, everybody else said, no, we, we don't want to call it by a famous wine region in Germany. We want to call it Ori. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of us were pretty intent on um, calling our wine something that kind of conjured, or our vineyard, something that kind of conjured up the image of Oregon as well. I, I mean, Irie, I think, just set the stage right there with uh, Irie Vineyards. I mean, that was, and his label and everything, just so Oregon. And then I think yeah. a lot of us kind of followed in that direction. Yeah. I think there's still really good, you know, you talk about the uh, early days in the industry and kind of cooperation, and um, I think that's certainly alive and well today. Mm -hmm. It's uh, new people it's coming in, I think, sometimes are surprised by the level of uh, openness, uh, and, you know, when we talk about, you know, things we do to, to try to grow better grapes or make high quality wine, but ultimately we, we know it, it you know makes all of us better and uh -huh. we still have this mentality that we're a small you know uh such a small part of the thing that if we can just get people to drink more oregon wine it'll you know our tide will rise as well yeah and i you know i think it's still true and there's not if we can just get a few more people on board we get plenty of market out there uh-huh <laughs> you know, yeah when uh uh, our contractor was building the winery in 1981. Uh, he he remarked on that. He said, "You know, he said I can't believe how you guys get along so well, and, and you know you have other people from other wineries coming out of your property and borrowing equipment." He says, "He said that would never happen in the construction industry." He yeah. said, "We'd be spying on each other and, <laughs> and, and never want to help each other out because you know." We, we wouldn't want to have the competition. Yeah, so it's nice. It's a rich kind of, you know, not only for our business, but, you know, socially and all that. It's it's nice to have, you know, I, I count, I think, you know, most of my, you know, best friends are uh, other winemakers and vineyard and winery owners from around the area. And um, you have a, a common experience, and especially with people from, you know, multi-generational wineries, you definitely have a common experience that, that uh, is fun to to uh, remark on and to help each other out and and uh, you know just bonded through that common experience. Yeah. 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 Well, for me, it's been really interesting looking at a number of multi generational you know families and looking at the family dynamics uh, and things. Um, yeah. So that's been a real interesting insight for for me. It's like with with the Let's. I photographed Jason and his dad. Um, they had just harvested from the south block. Mm -hmm. And so I had them just kind of standing in front of the fruit. And then Jason said to his dad, he said, well, dad, what do you think? What should I do with this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. I've had the opportunity, I think because I was a little bit early or into it, uh, I've had the opportunity to, to sit down and have lunch with a few different people that are, are kind of maybe more recently going through a similar transition to what I went through and they're kind of picking my brain and and I um, I think it's it's really fun to see those kind of transitions taking place and have you know for me to think back on um, our transition and uh, if there's a lesson to be learned or uh, you know it's always different too because you know some of the folks that I'm friendly with they have more brothers and sisters and more players involved, involved yeah. at that point I don't really know how to deal with brothers and sisters <laughs> uh -huh. and you don't uh, have that uh, not in the business so yeah. it's uh yeah that's a whole different ball game I kind of honestly I feel really fortunate that you know there's there's three of us to work on things together and essentially two families working on this together not five families or <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It, it uh, probably makes it quite a bit easier, although, uh, you know, the 
the Fetzer family, and it, they, they had 11 children, and they all Is that right? up 11? working in the wine business, and, and they, you know, of course they could send, they could send one to each part of the country, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they were able to expand really rapidly. Yeah. But not that we wanted to do that. I always find, think, you know, find one aspect of, of uh, the business, especially when you first get jumping into it. And for me, it was the vineyard. Find one thing that you can make your mark on and, uh -huh. and really uh, have an impact. And, uh, and then you can do anything from there, you yeah. know, rather than to try to understudy the whole role, just find one aspect of it and run with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. And then, then if, if you want to grow from that, Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so I mean, I think that's where I know when uh, my uh, sister, who's almost ten years younger, was contemplating it. I think, oh, come on in, you know. There's, we'll find some, you know, some aspect of it to take on, um, and uh, you know, I think you know, for us now, I think it's that's probably not going to happen. But if there's a one of my kids or a niece or a nephew that that wants to. Uh, be a part of this business there's definitely roles mm -hmm. for uh, sure. and just find what they're you know best at and uh -huh. have them take that on yeah <laughs>